Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the dimension formula. Okay, so we've now seen what the dimension formula says. Okay, and it says that the dimension of the domain vector space is equal to the dimension of the kernel of a linear transformation plus the dimension of the image of a linear transformation. Okay, so what's our tactics for proving this? So what we've done so far is we have said, okay, let's devise a clever basis for our domain vector space. Okay, we've devised a basis which is an extension of a basis for the kernel of T, which is a subspace of our vector space, capital V. Okay, so we started with a basis for the kernel of uh, the linear transformation and then extended it up to a basis for the entire vector space, which we can always do, because after all, this is a linearly independent space set uh, of vectors within the vector space capital V, and we know from our study of finite dimensional vector spaces that any linearly independent set can be extended up to form a basis. Okay, now, that means that any vector in our domain vector space can be expressed as a linear combination of the vectors of this basis, that's true for any basis, but what's special about this basis is that if we then consider what is T of V, so what does the linear transformation map any vector onto, well of course uh, again for any uh, basis we can split this into the expression here, C1 times T of V1 plus C2 times T of V2 all the way up to Cn times T of Vn, but what's special about this basis is that because these first k uh, vectors of the basis are actually elements of the kernel of the linear transformation, then we know that they're all going to be mapped onto the zero vector in the image of the linear transformation in the codomain vector space, and therefore we can replace all of those with the zero vector, and therefore we have shown that any vector in our domain vector space is actually going to be mapped on something of this form, ck plus 1 times tvk plus 1 plus all the way up to cn times tvn, i.e. a linear combination of the vectors that the basis vectors outside of the kernel, these basis vectors here, are mapped onto in the image of the linear transformation. Okay, and what I'm now trying to do then is prove that these vectors that I've got here, t of vk plus 1, t of vk plus 2, all the way up to t of vn, are actually uh, a basis for the image of the linear transformation. So to do that, what I need to prove is that this set of vectors spans the entire image of the linear transformation. I think I'll just uh, colour the image of the linear transformation in on this picture here. Okay, now that's not difficult to do, okay, because we can see from this here that any vector in the domain vector space here will be mapped onto something of this form, i.e. a linear combination of these vectors. Now anything that's in the image of the linear transformation has got a vector here that was mapped onto it. If all vectors here are mapped onto something of this form, then indeed all vectors in here will be a linear combination of these vectors here, i.e. they will be in the span of this set of vectors. So this set of vectors does span uh, the image of the linear transformation. The only thing that's left to prove is that this set of vectors is linearly independent, i.e. that the only linear combination that I can take of these vectors, which will give me the zero vector in the image of the linear transformation, is going to be the trivial linear combination where all of the coefficients, all of the scalar coefficients, are equal to zero. Okay, so what I'm going to do then is start off with a linear combination of these vectors in this set. So ck plus 1 times t of vk plus 1, plus all the way up until we've got cn times tvn, and this linear combination is going to equal the zero vector. And what I need to show is that if this is true, all of these scalars, ck plus 1, ck plus 2, all the way up to cn, I need to show that all of these scalar coefficients have to be equal to zero in the field. Okay, so I want to show that if this is true, it implies that these have to be equal to zero. So how am I going to do that? Well, what I'm going to do is acknowledge that this thing that I've got here is T of some element back in the vector space capital V. So what I can now do is work with my linear transformation in reverse, because this thing that I've got here, I can swallow the scalar coefficients back into inside the t here, okay, and then I can recombine them. So what this will end up as is t of ck plus 1 
times VK plus 1 plus all the way up until we've got CN times VN. Okay, and that's going to have to equal zero. Now that's perfectly true, that's the identical statement to what we've got here, because this thing here is exactly equal to this thing. Okay, so we haven't changed that statement at all, we've just um, rewritten it. Now, this is more easy to interpret, because what does this mean? This is saying that if we map this linear combination of the basis vectors that are outside of the kernel of the um, linear transformation in the uh, domain vector space into the codomain vector space, we are getting the zero vector. Now what does that mean about this linear combination of these basis vectors outside of the kernel of the linear transformation? That that is an element of the kernel of the linear transformation. If this is true, then this element, CK plus 1 times VK plus 1, all the way up to CN times VN, that must be an element of the kernel of the uh, linear transformation. Okay, so I'll go over the page and write that down. So what we now know is that CK plus 1 times VK plus 1, plus all the way up until we've got um, CN times VN, this is an element of the kernel of the linear transformation. But what do we know about any element that's in the kernel of the linear transformation? We know that it can be written as a linear combination of the basis vectors for the kernel of the linear transformation. Now remember the basis vectors are those vectors v1, v2, all the way up to vk. So what I can now do is say that ck plus 1 times vk plus 1 plus all the way up to Cn times Vn is equal to some linear combination of the basis vectors for the kernel of T. So we'll say C1, V1 plus C2, V2 plus all the way up to Ck, Vk. Okay, right. Now we're going to manipulate this a bit more. Okay, we're going to bring these ones here onto the other side. So I'm going to add the additive inverse of all of these onto both sides of the equation. So I'm going to add the additive inverse of C1 times V1 onto both sides. I'm going to add the additive inverse of C2 times V2 onto both sides, etc. all the way down, and I'll add the additive inverse of Cn, over, sorry, not Cn, Ck times Vk onto both sides. Now, of course, when I do that on the right-hand side, I will lose everything. Everything will cancel. So C1 times V1 will cancel with the additive inverse of C1 times V1. C2 times V2 will do the same, all the way up to CK times VK. Okay, and we'll end up with the zero vector on this side, but this is going to be the zero vector in the domain vector space, because all of this algebra that we're doing here, this is in the domain vector space. So we'll get zero in the domain vector space here. And on the other side, what we'll end up with now is we'll have the additive inverse of C1V1 plus the additive inverse of C2V2 whoops, and I got the negative inside uh, plus all the way up to the additive inverse of CKVK and then we'll have the rest of this bit here plus CK plus 1 times VK plus 1 plus all the way up to CN times VN all of this is equal to the zero vector here. Now we're almost ready to apply the fact that the basis v1, v2, uh, all the way up to vn is a basis of our domain vector space and therefore is linearly independent and therefore the only combination um, that can give the zero vector is the trivial one. But there's one final thing that we need to do because at the moment we've got things of this form the additive inverse of a scalar times a vector v now what we're going to do is apply the fact that the additive inverse of a scalar times a vector like that is the same as the additive inverse of the scalar in the field times the vector v. Okay, And the way that you can see that easily is just by considering what is cv plus the additive inverse of c scalar multiplied by v. Well, this actually is always going to give the zero vector in the vector space. The reason is that we can always factor out the vector v because of the fact that scalar multiplication distributes over addition in the field. So we can replace this with c plus negative c 
times v. So that's from the incredible axioms that we insist is true for scalar multiplication in a vector space. Okay, and then appreciate how incredible that is because this addition here is addition in the field over which the vector space is a vector space uh, and this addition here is addition in the vector space so we've turned addition in the vector space to addition in the field uh, using this distributive law that we insist is true for scalar multiplication and now of course when we add uh, c to negative c in the field we'll just get zero in the field. So we'll get the additive identity in the field and the additive identity multiplied by any vector through scalar multiplication will give us the zero vector in the vector space. So that's why um, the additive inverse of a scalar times a vector is equal to the additive inverse of that scalar in the field scalar multiplied by the vector in the vector space. Okay, so we're going to apply uh, that fact here to rewrite the additive inverse of C1 times V1 as the additive inverse of C1 in the field times V1 and so on for the, all the others as well. So we'll get the additive inverse of C2 scalar multiplied by V2 plus all the way up until we have the additive inverse of CK times VK. And now we truly do have a linear combination of our basis vectors of the domain vector space capital V that is giving the zero vector. And what do we know? Well, we know that the basis vectors of our domain vector space are indeed linearly independent. So we know that the only linear combination that can do this is where all of these coefficients have to be equal to zero in the field. So that now tells us that CK plus one, CK plus two, all the way up to CN, these have to all be zero. And indeed the negative C1, negative C2, all the way up to negative CK will also be zero. But we don't care about those. The bit that we care about is this bit here. Okay, we have now shown that CK plus one all the way up to CN is equal to the zero in the field, the additive identity in the field, which is exactly what we needed to show. So through just algebraic manipulations, I have been able to show that if you have a linear combination of these vectors, TVK plus one, all the way up to TVK, and this is a linear combination done in our image of our linear transformation in the codomain vector space, and that's giving you the zero vector in the uh, image of the linear transformation, then I have proven now that the only way that that can work is if CK plus one, all the way up to CN, is equal to the additive identity in the field capital F. Okay, so we now have successfully proven then that this set of vectors is linearly independent. So indeed, this is a basis of the image of the linear transformation. So is a basis of the image of the linear transformation. So what then is this telling us? Okay, because this is telling us something very deep about uh, linear transformations. Okay, so if you have this linear transformation here, which is mapping our vector space V here onto the image of the linear transformation, because remember this portion of the code main vector space capital W, which is outside of the image of the linear transformation, that isn't getting any vectors mapped onto it. So effectively, this is a mapping from the domain vector space onto the image of the linear transformation. What we have now learned is that if you express all of the vectors in your domain vector space according to a basis that is made by uh, starting with the basis vectors for the kernel of the linear transformation, so start with a basis for the kernel of the linear transformation and then extend that up with loads of vectors that are outside of the kernel of the linear transformation, okay, then um, the, the images of these basis vectors that are outside of the kernel of the linear transformation, so what they're mapped onto by the linear transformation, that set will form a basis for the image of the linear transformation. And that's the incredible deep fact that is encapsulated in the dimension formula. Okay, so just to finish then the argument of why the dimension formula is true, well, the dimension for the image of the linear transformation is just how many of these vectors you have in this basis for your domain vector space, which are outside of the kernel of the linear transformation. So here are the ones from the kernel of the linear transformation. Here are the ones uh, from outside 
of the kernel of the linear transformation and we know these are the ones that are going to be mapped onto vectors which will form a basis of the image of the linear transformation. So the rank of the matrix, sorry not the rank of the matrix, the rank of the linear transformation will just be equal to how many you have here which is just n minus k. Okay so r is equal to n minus k. Okay, so we can see, therefore, that we can just rearrange this into n is equal to r plus k. If you add together the number of vectors that are in the basis of the image of the linear transformation with the number of vectors that are in the uh, basis for the kernel of the linear transformation, you get the number of vectors that makes the basis of the entire domain vector space. Okay, and that's why the dimension formula is true. Okay, so just to point out a final little corollary of this, what we can see is that if our starting vector space, if our domain vector space capital V is a finite dimensional vector space, then the image of the linear transformation will also always be a finite dimensional vector space. We can't necessarily conclude that the entire codomain vector space will be a finite dimensional vector space, but we can conclude that the sub-portion, the subspace that we're actually mapping onto will be a finite dimensional vector space. Okay, so that then uh, concludes our discussion of the dimension formula.